afternoon and welcome to Governance Dialogues. My, my name is Elisa Cole and I'm the Managing Director of Governance Center. And for those of you who have joined this program in the past, you know that uh, on this show we dissect uh, governance developments um, with, in conversations with thought leaders, be they board members, investors, regulators, uh, and other market participants. And in previous episodes, we've uh, dedicated quite a bit of time to talking about board efficiency, which is naturally um, a, a very important topic in the world of governance. But we haven't yet addressed one particular angle, and that is the angle of uh, executive compensation and remuneration. And that specific topic in the world of governance, but also in the corporate world, has, has actually um, been gaining momentum and for quite some time uh, since the last financial crisis. Um, uh, standards, national standards and international standards on governance have uh, specifically been uh, tailored to address issues dealing with executive compensation with a view that boards um, should have a greater uh, say or pay more attention to executive compensation, notably um, aligning uh, executive pay with long-term performance uh, metrics. Um, and it's interesting that despite that emphasis um, that, um, that we're seeing for more than a decade now, uh, evidence points uh, that to the fact that executive compensation practices have in many ways not changed all that much. Um, and only in yesterday's uh, Financial Times article called for all their fine words, CEOs aren't sharing the pain. Some of the numbers um, uh, clearly demonstrate the, um, this, this tendency of, of of uh, executive pay uh, not changing that much or not being reined in so much, so to speak. And, and actually the opposite tendency where um, we're seeing um, uh, an increase for, for the 11th consecutive year of executive pay practices, uh, in particular in some markets uh, as the US, uh, the increasing growth between uh, CEO and employee uh, sort of pay wedge um, and changes that don't necessarily point to the fact that executive pay has, has so to speak, been reined in. So this is, in fact, um, the topic that I would like to discuss uh, today. Um, and I've invited um, uh, to this program Tom Gosling, who is um, a, an expert and a specialist on, on corporate governance, but in executive pay in particular, not only in the UK, uh, for where, from where he's joining us today, but also uh, worldwide. So, Tom, it's, uh, it's really a pleasure to have you uh, join us today for this conversation. A great pleasure to be here. Very much looking forward to it. Thank you. And, and really, I would like to, to you know, leverage your experience. I know you're sort of passionate, as I am, and, and on connecting the world of policy, uh, evidence, uh, you know, academia and, and practice. And, and just for our audience, I'd just like to say a few words to introduce you. Um, you're obviously specialized on, 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 on governance, currently serving as executive fellow at the London Business School. You're also on the steering uh, committee of the Purposeful Company. And uh, needless to say, uh, your work um, leading uh, corporate governance and executive pay uh, area, particularly the PwC for, I think, about uh, you know, 20 years, if I'm not mistaken. Longer than I'd care to remember. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> is, 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 of course, of relevance here. And you've advised uh, you know, a number of uh, FTSE, um, uh, FTSE uh, 100 companies on their, on their remuneration practices. Mm. So with that, that being said, I'd like to, to really ask you your thoughts um, on this FT piece and, and really mm. kind of in a more long-term way. Do you see that uh, over the last, you know, um, well, now more than a decade since the last financial crisis, have remuneration practices been uh, addressed? What have the changes that we've been seeing and how might they be different market to market? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think overall there's been there's been quite a lot of change in in remuneration practices, particularly in terms of remuneration design, uh, and a little bit less change in terms of remuneration levels. And I'll maybe kind of talk about each of them, and then we can pick up what you mentioned in the FT article yesterday, which is really a kind of a COVID related issue, I think. But I, it, you know, if you look at remuneration design since the financial crisis, I mean, across all markets. We've seen uh, reforms uh, in, in, in the timescales of pay. So generally pay is now longer term. Um, you know, five years is now very common in terms of deferral periods on pay programs. We've seen widespread introduction of clawback arrangements. 
uh, we've seen uh, strengthening shareholder powers, which have in turn led to greater use of performance conditions and tougher performance conditions on pay. And we've also seen a very significant reduction in what you might call perks, you know, so fancy pension plans, private jets, chauffeurs, all of that kind of stuff. You know, those have really been been cleaned up and, and, and taken out of the system. And those trends are pretty true across major developed markets. When it comes to levels, it's, it's, it's much more of a, of a mixed picture. Uh, I mean, in the UK, for example, actually executive pay has declined in real terms since the financial crisis. Uh, in the US, it's continued to go up, although at a much lower rate than it went up before the financial crisis. And, and one of the things that we've seen a bit of is there has been a degree across major markets of convergence of pay levels. And, and I think it's quite important to sort of set this story of pay levels in its historical context. Because if you go back really to the 1990s, which is when pay started to take off massively in the US with greater use of stock options, the US really just stormed away as a market in pay levels and you know, occupied a completely different universe when it came to pay levels, particularly for CEOs. Then after the dot-com crash, actually that pay dropped quite a lot in the US for CEOs. But at the same time, the rest of the world started catching up. So in the UK and Europe during the 2000s, pay actually increased very rapidly during that period. So we had this sort of period up to the financial crisis where the US was coming down, UK and Europe were coming up, and they never quite met, but there was a much broader degree of convergence. What we've seen since is um, you know, some splintering between markets. So the UK has gone from being the second highest paying market globally to kind of down in the pack a bit behind a number of European territories. Uh, the US has continued to go up, albeit, albeit more slowly. And in part, these differences in trends are differences in political context in different countries, but also differences in regulation. Interesting. I mean, I think that um, particularly your, your comments on, on the US and, and UK differences in other European markets are, 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 are insightful. And the, the article that I was alluding to also mentioned to, uh, for mm. example, uh, differences in, um, in CEO to employee ratios, which is something that um, I think it's a metric that has been, correct me if you, if you see it differently, a little bit politicized in a sense that you know, the whole uh, <laughs> yeah. discourse around equality uh, has really zoomed into, you know, taking a CEO, uh, CEO salary, uh, let's say in absolute terms with what, what you say perks and trying to, to compare it to the, some, some of the lowest performing workers mm. in the company. And to some extent, I mean, I can see the logic kind of from an equality and, and uh, social uh, perspective, the logic uh, behind doing it. In other ways, you know, in terms of measuring CEO compensation, one could say, how meaningful is doing that and, and, and showing these various differences. So, you know, um, I'm curious to have your views on, on evolutions in, in different markets, as, as you mm. already alluded to, UK versus US versus other European countries. And mm. if you can even go to emerging markets where I think that the situation is, is, is completely different. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I'd agree with that. And, and um, you know, I'd say, you know, there are, there, are, there are regulatory and cultural differences. And obviously there's a relation between the two because cultural differences in part determine what regulation gets put in place. But you mentioned that FT article this morning and maybe just focus on, on that particular issue to, to get into this discussion, which showed that uh, executive pay levels have continued to go up in the US last year, despite COVID, whereas actually in the UK, they, they dropped uh, last year. And, um, you know, one of the reasons behind that is that, you know, a number of U.S. compensation committees did some sort of resetting of plans as a result of COVID, which might have been adjusting targets for COVID or given that stock options were underwater, maybe making new plan grants. That has been virtually impossible for remuneration committees to do in the U.K. And one of the main reasons for that is actually the regulatory differences that there have been, because although both the US and the UK now have say on pay and, and have done had that for over a decade, in the UK, shareholders get a binding vote on the remuneration policy, which sets out in some detail what remuneration committees are legally allowed to do, whereas in the US, it's all still advisory. So remuneration committees can't just sort of make it up as they go along in the UK anymore. I mean, they really have quite a tight 
set of boundaries within which they have to work. And through the shareholder rights directive, that has now moved out into the rest of the EU, that broad framework that we have in the UK. And I think there's also a cultural difference because certainly very much in, the, in, in, in Europe, the feeling has been, you know, everybody's suffering through this pandemic and it's absolutely right that um, executives should share in that pain, right? So, so the fairness narrative is really, really important. I would say that in the US, and actually I think that this is probably a little bit more true in, in many emerging markets, although it's a little bit dangerous to use emerging markets as a kind of a catch-all term, as you'll, as you'll know. But I mean, in the US, there's much more of a culture that says, you know, actually this period is a transformative period for business. Right. The, 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 the impact of strategic decisions that leaders make now is probably bigger than it has been for a decade or will be for a decade. And therefore, great leadership and motivating and retaining great leadership is more important than ever. And that narrative tends to hold much more sway in U.S. boards than than just a simple fairness narrative. And so that 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 cultural difference, combined with the fact that, frankly, U.S. boards have more leeway around what they can do because it's just advisory regime there has meant that actually the responses to covid have, have been quite different and you know and it's difficult to know who's right here right because from a social perspective you say you know this, this you know, inequality isn't something that can be ignored forever right i mean it, you you feel that there's a price to be paid for it at some point but on the other hand you kind of look at the performance of us versus uk companies and you kind of say well you know, maybe they're getting something right over there in some respects. Now, whether that's due to the pay system, who you know, I think we could overstate it. But, you know, it's a, it's a really fascinating difference. And Europe, I would say European territories are you know, a little bit closer to the UK in that in that philosophy. But emerging markets, uh, many territories, you know, still much more. Um, you know, much more in a, in, in, in a growth phase and um, more entrepreneurial phase and are a little bit closer to some of the US attitudes, I'd say. You think so? It's interesting because in some of the emerging markets I've worked in, in particular in the Middle East, I often think and say, um, I, I speak also at a quite a number of corporate, corporate governance conferences, and I always say that I don't think that compensation is to the, to the same extent an issue because they don't really have variable pay. And in so far as you have a system where you have, yeah. you know, controlling shareholders and the way that, uh, let's say, remuneration or a real, uh, you know, money in the economy circulates is not through through pay, but it, it's also it's actually through through share ownership. So I think that the yeah. The, the, the problems are quite different. And I guess, as, as you say, it's, it's emerging market is too broad of a term to, to really capture all these nuances. But there are a number of fascinating topics you're, you're you know, raising in terms of the binding nature of, of, of pays versus, versus you know, shareholder resolutions or shareholder approvals versus not. Um, and, and also the role of remuneration committees, which is also, you know, it's relatively, I mean, in, in if you take the history of corporate governance as a kind of a, in a long term way, um, a, a relatively new construct. Mm. And, and from what you, if I hear you correctly, what you're suggesting is that that the the you know the the corporate governance regulations or laws where where they are actually more of a law um, has have have had a greater impact on let's say addressing pay than, for example, you know, let's say structures at the level of the board, like remuneration committees, which might operate differently depending on the legal uh, framework. Yeah, so I think both have had an impact. So I think, you know, I mean, my, my career has pretty much sort of matched the kind of emergence of remuneration committees as a separate entity. So I've sort of seen how it's emerged. And I would say that as that sort of process has matured, you know, the greater independence of remuneration committees, you know, is, is real. I mean, they are much, much more independent than they were 15 years ago. Uh, and so that has made a difference anyway. Uh, and um, say on pay has, has made a difference. But you are right that, um, you know, the legal constraints that remuneration committees face in the UK and now Europe do, do make a difference. And you can argue whether that's a, a good or a bad thing. I mean, you know, I think that it's meant that remuneration committees are definitely more constrained, but it's also meant that they play much more by standardised proxy agency rules. And it's not clear so much now that remuneration committees are able to use pay in a way that's tailored to company circumstances. It's become much more of sort of a standardised kind of hygiene factor. So I think, I think there are pluses and minuses of that. I mean, if your overarching goal 
is for pay to go down or not go up as fast. There's no doubt that wrapping it up in all sorts of legal constraints meets that goal. If your goal is to use pay to as a mechanism for supporting better company performance and the benefits that that brings to wider society, then you know I think that some of these stricter regulations uh, come out less favorably uh, in in the analysis. I, I agree with you, and which is why I, I actually invited you to this program because I find your approach is quite nuanced in, in looking at you know what are the policy priorities you know because the mm. if that you mentioned is important if what is the ultimate objective is it social equality is it better corporate performance and to what extent are these uh, objectives finally fully reconcilable because often you know in the discourse that we see in the corporate governance world. Uh, everyone wants to say that you know greater diversity leads to greater performance, uh, lower pay leads to better performance. But you know, as, yeah. as you point out in some of your recent uh, thought pieces, that um, there are, the devil is in the details. And actually, I'd like to come back to this point of um, social performance and ESG, which you know has become mm -hmm. probably the most fashionable acronym yeah, uh, has, yeah, yeah. In, in the last year. Um, and again, come back to this FT piece because there was an interesting data point in there uh, referring to. 19% um, of companies worldwide now trying to tie executive compensation mm -hmm. to some sort of ESG metrics. And mm -hmm. when I say some sort of exactly that, that is the perhaps the issue because as we all know, the the, the kind of metrics company use in, in defining ESG can be very different, mm -hmm. not only based on sector, but, are, but many other parameters. And I know you have views on, on, on that. Um, and I would like to ask you, you know, to what extent you think that executive pay should be, in fact, tied to ESG parameters. Is it a, a, a you know, is it a good idea? Yeah, I mean, so this is another one of these areas where I have a slightly sort of um, countercultural uh, view because definitely the zeitgeist is that you know we want more ESG, therefore we have to pay for it. And um, we do, we just did a, a big study on this actually at the Centre for Corporate Governance at, at London Business School with with PwC that that looks at how to think about a framework for linking ES uh, pay to ESG, and. Um, I'm going to, I'm, I'm, first of all, I suppose it's worth pointing out that this is happening, right? So more and more companies are doing it. Um, I mean, in the UK and the Netherlands, it's actually more like half of companies that are now linking um, executive pay to ESG. And so in certain territories, it's moving ahead very fast. And we're also seeing changes in what is being linked to ESG. So, you know, for some years now, people have linked um, you know, uh, uh, health and safety KPIs or employee engagement KPIs to pay. Uh, but we're now seeing the emergence of new ESG measures, um, most predominantly climate goals and diversity goals. And those are the ones that we're really seeing as being the newcomers in, in the sort of pay debate. But I'm, I'm just going to start off with some of the risks around linking ESG to pay before finishing maybe on a positive note on what some of the benefits might be. I, I think the three big risks are, you know, first that you can kind of get into yourself into a situation where you hit the target but completely miss the point. And uh, one example of that is if you take banks uh, and ESG targets for banks. If, you've, if a bank has an ESG target about reducing the carbon footprint from its own operations, that's kind of irrelevant in terms of banks' role in climate change. I mean, banks' role in climate change is all about financing, right? So, so one problem is that you can just get these ESG targets that somehow just don't align with, with, with the firm's critical, issue, critical impact on ESG. I think the second one is that you can distort incentives. So by putting one aspect of an ESG measure in incentives, you can distract focus from the, from the other areas. And in fact, evidence shows that you can, you can crowd out intrinsic motivation as well. I think the classic example of this is, is diversity, where people are falling over themselves to put board diversity targets into pay plans, whereas we kind of know that that's sort of irrelevant uh, to actually making progress on diversity. And it's what's happening more broadly through the organization that really counts. And then the third risk is around calibration. Does anyone really know how tough these targets are? And, you know, we know that non-financial and strategic targets pay out 10 to 15 percentage points higher than financial targets on average. So I think there's a real risk that more ESG in pay just ends up meaning more pay. So, you know, so there are some big risks that we need to, need to manage, manage around this. And I suppose the final observation I'd make is that, 
we, we have this sort of very strange relationship with CEO pay, because on the one hand, we sort of blame it for all the world's ills, and then we seek to use it to solve all the world's problems. So we're trying to sort of turn this sinner into a saint. And um, I'm, I, I'm, I'm just not so convinced about that. And, and this idea that by using ESG pay targets, we can get these nasty CEOs to sort of focus on ESG when they wouldn't have done otherwise, it just shows a complete misunderstanding of how governance works. No, no board is going to set ESG pay targets that aren't aligned with the company's strategy. So they're not going to use pay as a way to get the CEO to do things that the CEO doesn't want to do. Pay, pay follows strategy. So I think we hope for far too much in relation to linking ESG um, into pay schemes. And there are significant risks of it, of, of it actually not really improving matters and maybe making them worse. But let me finish with a positive, right? Because I've been kind of negative about this whole thing. When, when I've spoken to organizations who passionately believe in the benefits of linking pay to ESG, overwhelmingly, it's nothing to do with the CEO. It's all to do with mobilizing action through the organization. So, you know, if you speak to people like Unilever who have incorporated this sustainable living plan into their pay plans, for them, it was all about a stage in their progression of really trying to get greater engagement from managers around the whole uh, the sustainable living plan issue, but also showing them that acting on these matters, you know, wasn't going to harm their pay outcomes, even if it, even if it kind of costs some short-term financial performance. So I think the positive is when we think about it less as a way to sort of micromanage CEOs and more as a way of supporting cultural change through, through organizations. I think it's interesting, and as, as you say, it's an, an orthodox approach today because, you know, it, there is this kind of bandwagon tendency to want to say, you know, let's let's have, uh, um, let's use corporate governance as a blunt tool to increase, uh, you know, diversity uh, at, the, at the level of the board, which then cascades at the level of the organization. And a lot of assumptions are sort of being made about how these processes work that, they're, as you say, not necessarily um, supported um, by empirical evidence, and and mm. um, since you 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 pick up on the issue of diversity, and it's it's uh, it's one that mm. uh, is difficult to ignore when we talk about uh, corporate governance today. Mm. Uh, I don't think we'll have we'll have time to 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 do it justice in this conversation. Yeah. But from from an angle of remuneration, I know you you you've done some work on disclosure of compensation uh, and between sort of uh, men and women and looking yeah. at what, what impact that has had. And again, the idea in the mainstream is of mm. course, the more you disclose, the better it mm. is. And therefore by embarrassing, uh, you know, mm. revealing embarrassing gaps, these gaps are therefore closed. But it seems that you, you also have evidence that uh, shows that that is not always the case, correct? It's not always the case. I, I, although I have to say, I mean, I mean, I think a lot of disclosure around pay has has backfired. Uh, you know, I think that that's clear. I think this is one example: the disclosure of gender pay gaps. I think, on balance, has had a benefit. Actually, you know, even though it's an incredibly crude measure, and you can definitely criticise it for what it shows, it's also quite a clever measure because it hones in on the really key issue, which is not really about like pay for like work. It's about the differences in representation at levels within organizations. And there's no doubt that the embarrassment factor has caused boards to uh, place more emphasis on, on that question than might have been the case otherwise. I think the problem is that when you, when you look at what's necessary in order to shift that metric over time, I mean, it's actually, it's, it's, it's really, really tough to do. So, you know, how, if you take a bank, for example, yeah, part of the pay gap is, is driven by the fact that a lot of the high earning investment bankers are men, but it's also driven by the fact that a lot of the people that work in branches are, are women. And it's, you know, and the, and some of these changes will take a massive amount of time to shift. And um, so in a way, I'm quite happy that, that, that light has been shone on that issue. And I think pay gaps can do that. But if we start expecting them to change year on year, I mean, there might be some things that actually make things worse before they get better. You know, so if you have a, if you have a situation where you have, um, for example, you know, if you take a mining company or something 
uh, and it's very male dominated, one of the ways in which you can solve that problem long term is by doing massively more graduate recruitment of women. But then the problem with that is in the short term, you're bringing in more low paid women. So you're going to make your, your pay gap worse. So the problem is if we, if we you know, fail to be nuanced about how we look at the implications of this and also recognizing that you know, solving these problems around diversity, it's not just a numbers game. It's, it's not just about forcing minority or underrepresented populations into existing systems and structures. That, that's almost certainly not going to work because those systems and structures have been designed by and for largely white men. So we shouldn't be surprised if actually we don't get great success if all we do is just change the makeup. Uh, what we really need to do is, you know, look quite fundamentally at, at the way work is organized um, and, you know, very difficult work around getting all of these sort of hidden biases out of evaluation systems, promotion systems, so on and so forth. So it's, it's going to be a long, long, hard road. But actually, the gender pay gap and ethnicity pay gaps, I think they do usefully shed, shed a light that reminds us actually how big the issue is. Hmm. I mean, I was referring notably, I think there was an article you have and you have um, on your own website and I will we'll give a link to that. Oh, you talk about the Danish one, the exactly. Danish example. Exactly. So I was ah, yeah, yeah, to, yeah. to that example and, and what we'll do in the in the um, in this yeah. episode is give links uh, to some of the, the fascinating work you've been doing for those who are interested to sort of delve um, a little bit further, but for the interest of time, you know, we, we said we'd uh, keep Sorry, it yeah, I missed the target on that one. I know what you're talking about now. Yes, yeah. exactly, the Danish article. But we'll have a chance to, to speak about that yeah. in, in, in the future um, conversations. But just to close, I guess, today's um, episode, you've sketched out, I think what's interesting, uh, a lot of the nuances that, that I think evade uh, the mainstream debate, which, which, mm. I, which I think are, are interesting and relevant to look into, and I think not many people, in fact, do. Um, and I think, you know, to, to my mind, and given our work with, with regulators and with companies, it seems that it's, it's a topic that will stay uh, in the mainstream along with a diversity, perhaps is kind of on the, you know, on the, on the top of the corporate governance uh, pyramid. Um, mm-hmm. and, and it seems to me that regulators will continue kind of honing in standards and, and trying to, to address this perennial um, sort of, um, let's say, lack of uh, you know, adjust or, you know, differences between long term objectives of, of companies and, and uh, executive compensation, um, but also, you know, shortening, like, for example, in the UK, the disclosure reporting requirements, trying to do away with quarterly reporting. So mm-hmm. um, a lot of things seem to be happening in that area. Um, as a last question, if I may, just sort of from a regulatory perspective, what do you think are some of the areas that regulators might wish to look into or are looking into now? that they haven't looked after uh, the last crisis? What might be some of them, let's say, the new, the new measures that are coming, uh, coming to fore? Well, I mean, if we look at, um, let, let me answer that from, from the executive pay angle, because that's, the, that's exactly. the focus of this conversation today. Um, you know, I think if there are concerns around um, short-termism in, in markets, which on the whole, I think are a little bit overblown, frankly, but I mean, I think one of the one of the problems with short-termism has arisen through the design of pay models. So one of the ironies around giving investors kind of more say on pay systems is that they've pushed more and more for the attachment of performance targets to those pay systems. And that, that puts a lot of stress in the system because a lot of CEOs have about 80 percent of their pay linked to performance targets and on the one hand you'd say well that's quite difficult to argue against right why should they get paid if they don't perform i think there are a couple of issues with it one is that it puts a lot of pressure on the governance system within boards because the stakes are so high um, that actually it puts huge pressure on the calibration process but more important than that most of these targets are set over periods of one to three years. And there's a lot of evidence that actually targets do influence performance, but not always in the way that you might wish. So I think, you know, regulatory moves to encourage simpler pay plans that are more based on kind of long-term share ownership as opposed to setting short to medium-term targets would actually be very beneficial in supporting this concept of uh, longer-term, more purposeful companies. And part of this, I think, comes back to something I said before, which is that we ask too much of executive pay. 
we think that executive pay can solve all of these problems if only we kind of micromanage it a little bit better. And it reminds me a little bit of um, sort of diehard communists who after the fall of the Soviet Union, you know, you would say, oh yeah, but communism hasn't worked in the past because it's never been done properly. And we seem to have this sort of obsession that somehow if only if we could sort of set pay properly, it would solve all of our problems. Actually, you know, we need to look at, we, we need to just be less ambitious around what we can achieve with pay and keep it a little bit simpler and maybe spend a little bit more time talking about more important governance topics. I mean, I think that's a, that's a, that's a great way to end this conversation, if not for the fact that I also lived in the Soviet Union, so I definitely uh, <laughs> identify with the, with the comment you just made. Um, and I think that we, we canvassed a, a number of really important uh, topics and, and I think you, in this conversation, hopefully revealed for our audience a number of nuances that um, I think, again, would be worth to perhaps explore with you in, in, in future conversations um, on this program. But for the purposes of today's dialogue on whether pay is really sort of a villain or a saint, I'd like to, just to thank you for, for taking the time to share your thoughts and we'll be um, sharing um, also um, some of the links to, to your research and to the work that we're doing in this area. So thank you, Tom, for, 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 for taking the time. It's been a great pleasure. Really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. And for our audience, we um, will be joining, we'll be following this episode with other um, um, slightly related uh, conversations on long termism and loyalty shares and dual class shares um, in the following uh, episodes of this program. So thank you for joining us today. Mm -hmm.